May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you believe the tour guide, I have touched trees that have been standing in the Garden of Gethsemane since Jesus was there. I've touched trees that Jesus touched. Maybe. Either way, it was a pretty cool experience. A few years ago, uh, some people from church took a trip to the Holy Land, and one of the highlights for me had to be the Garden of Gethsemane. We had half of the place reserved just for our group, so we got to have a nice, peaceful, calm devotion there in the garden, and I got to read the, the text of Scripture of what happened in that very place. When Jesus was praying to his father, remember? And then, then when Jesus was betrayed. And then we got some time to pray while we were touching those trees. If you believe the tour guide, the very ones that Jesus would have been touching. Now you may initially say, okay, that's just crazy. That guy's just trying to sell something. There's no way that those are actually the trees. But, and scientifically, there is some debate as to whether those trees are more than 2,000 years old or between 1,500 and 1,700 years old. There's people who say, who say either. So it's possible that those were the very trees that, that were standing there. Because olive trees, well, they, they do something interesting. They live like regular living things, and they grow, and, and then they die. That's what living things do. And the leaves fall off, and they stop producing fruit, and, and, and the wood starts to decay. But then, out of the rootstock, new shoots sprout up in that dead tree and, and grow up through it and kind of force its way out and kind of connect with the, the wood that had been there. And so it lives again and then it, it dies and then new shoots and it lives and it keeps going and growing and spreading. And yeah, botanists say that there are some of those trees that are several thousand years old. They just haven't agreed on the age for, for those trees in the Garden of Gethsemane. But it's still a pretty cool story. It's a powerful picture. It's a picture that our Old Testament lesson, this passage from Isaiah, uses to tell a story, to prophesy reality, really. Because today, Isaiah tells us, behold, a branch is growing. He says that these, this new shoot, this new sprout, is growing up in, in this dead stump of Jesse's family line. So, so David, King David's family tree. He tells us that a branch is growing, and it grows out of death. It grows bringing life. <clears throat> it's a story as old as parenting. Right? The father has a child. He loves the child. He provides for the child. He gives the child everything he possibly can, the best he gives the child the best teaching, the best uh, opportunities, the, the best. He proves to that child again and again that he loves the child by, by proving that he's able to provide for and, and care for and protect that child over and over. And, and, and the father wants the child to do right. He tells the child to do right. But the child disobeys. And so the father warns but the child disobeys. And so the father warns, but the child disobeys. And so the father warns and, and even shows that child, look at what happens when someone goes in, in that path. The, these are the gory details of what happens and, and the punishment that is coming. And he warns, but the child disobeys. And the father warns, but the child disobeys. And so eventually the father has to punish, right? <clears throat> it's a story that has repeated itself throughout history. But I think you know who I'm talking about here. It's the people of Israel. Right? God made them his special people, his, his precious children. 
He gave to that wanderer Abraham a promise and a land, and he gave promises to that his descendants after him again and again, promise after promise. He proved time and again that, that he was able to provide for them and protect them. He proved that they could trust in him. He gave them everything. He gave them a, a nation, a king more powerful than any other king, a righteous king, a, a, a king that, that, that conquered the, the whole land and, and had such stability that he could hand over a kingdom to his son and his son would never have to fight a war. You've got David and, and Solomon, right? God had given them everything. The people of Israel had every proof Miraculous victory after miraculous victory after relief from from whatever tragedy again and again God had proven his love and he told them to be faithful But they disobeyed and so he warned But they disobeyed and he warned and they disobeyed and he warned and they disobeyed and then he he sent the Assyrians to come and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel and he told the southern kingdom of of Judah you know where Jerusalem was he he said watch out or the same thing's gonna happen to you you got to be faithful and and they disobeyed and he warned and they disobeyed and he warned and they disobeyed and finally he had to punish as any loving father and he sent in the Babylonians to cut down that proud family tree of David's. They left the temple in ashes. They knocked down those proud city walls. They brought down that proud populace and made them slaves in a foreign land. Nothing but a stump. Death. David's tree was gone. But they did have that, that 700-year-old promise that God had given through Isaiah, right? Behold, a, a branch is growing. Look at what he says. <clears throat> a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, this dead stump. And he says it'll be productive. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The, the spirit of Wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. I mean, this sounds like another David, right? Or, or another Solomon, or really the, the best combination of both. That was the promise, but look around. It, it was a stump. The promises didn't sound very likely to come true. I mean, David had lived so long ago. And yeah, there were some kings after him in his line, but pretty soon they were, they were gone because they had been pretty weak. And, well, the people of Israel had been bouncing from one world superpower to the next, and finally they, they begged the Romans to come in and help them, and the Romans did come in and help them and took over, and then they begged for someone to take away the Romans because they, they couldn't get rid of them. And that proud family was a stump. There's a reason that uh, what you know of great King David's hometown, the only description you think of for it is old little town of Bethlehem. Dead. So relate to that feeling for a moment. You've played the good old days game before, haven't you? Where you remember, notice the air quotes, how things used to be, right? How everything was wonderful. And there were no problems at all. And life was so great and everybody loved each other. And and things just, and we had everything we needed. And it was so nice and wonderful and peaceful. But now, it's not like that, right? Good old days, oh, so, but now... It's a stump, right? Okay, so take, take Christmas, and, and I'm sure you've done the good old days game with, with Christmas, right? You know, do you remember, and by remember, maybe I'm mixing a little bit of a Norman Rockwell painting and, and some Coca-Cola ads and, and uh, the uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart movie, all kind of... Remember when, when at Christmas, 
everybody came to church and the whole town gathered and there were these wonderful celebrations and everyone had such a great time. Even the Grinch was there and we were all happy and people were giving gifts and it was wonderful and no one was missing and everyone was there and it was so great. But now, man, I wish it were like that, right? Because now there's the, the pain and stress and and the busyness of the Christmas season. And, and man, it, it, twisting arms to get people to, to come to church to these wonderful things. And, and, and boy, I don't remember there, there being that feeling of emptiness around the holidays when, when I was a kid. It, it must not have been there. The, uh, the stress or the fear or the guilt. Boy, things were so good then. And now, it's just a stump. Right? And the worst part is, we brought it on ourselves. Right? Just like the Israelites with all their disobedience, they brought on all that problem. What have we done to Christmas? You know, the, the scheduling that forgets what's, what's really important, the, 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 the making it all about me, you know, what am I getting or what am I giving? The stress, the, the nostalgia, thinking of how good it was so that I don't appreciate how good it is and the blessings that God has given me. Man, we can relate to those Israelites and we look around and we see death. When Isaiah talks about the judge coming in this text, we see every reason for him to do what he says in verse 4, to strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. And he might as well start with us. The, the bad feelings that, that we have sometimes aren't even close to what we deserve. But listen to God's word. Behold, a branch is growing. It grows out of that death. To us who see death all around, to us who sometimes feel like that death, his promise gives life. This, this branch growing out of a dead family tree, ha having moved long ago from the capital city of Jerusalem with all of its grandeur, now where is it? It's in some backwater carpenter shop in Nazareth. And, and even then, it can't stay there. It's forced to, to, to move to the still little town of Bethlehem because of a Roman census. There in that seeming dead stump, a branch grows. A child is born. And look at how Isaiah describes him. Verse 2, he'll have the spirit. And we read about all those descriptions of the spirit he has, right? Verse 3, he'll, he'll come in the fear of the Lord. Verse 4, he'll be a good king. But I'll read it again. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Just like God brought judgment on his rebellious child Israel, this one that we're waiting for would bring some judgment as well with his word, with his mouth, Isaiah says. Think of the message we heard in our gospel lesson today from Jesus' forerunner, from John the Baptist. Sum it up in one word. Repent. Turn. When you look around and see that your Christmas is more stress and guilt than joy and peace, more sham and shame than glory and, and praise, hear John's message. Repent. He says, the axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And then John promises that the one coming after him is more powerful, who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire, whose winnowing fork is in his hand, who will burn up the chaff. This branch is growing out of a dead stump, but in order to bring life, first he proclaims death, to cut off those who think they are alive, to get in the way of, of the growth. He's bringing his word to knock us down for all the times we try to pretend that, that we're just fine without him. For all the times that we try to put makeup on the pig of our busyness and distractedness and, and act like that's all good. Repent, 
John says. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Don't just keep going through the motions, but turn. Turn to him. Behold, a branch is growing. And the reason he brings the word of his law, that that word of death, is because he has something far better that he wants us to be ready for. Once he's knocked out all our pretend, once he's taken down all the fake book worthy photos of how, how everything is just perfect on the outside, and he gets us to realize our need, this branch that came in the dead stump brings life. Look at verse 5. Righteousness will be his belt. And faithfulness, the sash around his waist. He came for a reason, to be the perfect branch and to perfectly fulfill what he came to do. To make that description, you see in verses 6 to 9 of that absolutely perfect place where there's no no animosity, there's no problems, to make that a, a reality. He promises us a future because of what he came to do, to be the perfection that we could not achieve. And to pay for our sins to make us clean. He experienced death because that's what we had coming, but but he didn't stay dead. Behold, the branch is growing. He rose. And then that sprout of life out of the dead tree suddenly becomes a tree himself by the end of our text, and, and we're the fruit on it. So now, not only is his life our life, Not only do we have a future of the wolf and lamb lying down together in this perfect peace, but but we have that life now. Look at what he says in verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse, so that day, today, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him. So whether you're gathering over Christmas with 100 family members or you're all by yourself, behold, the branch is growing. And he grows to bring life. No matter what your celebration or or, or family tree might look like, God's word says that you're part of a much bigger party, a much bigger family, a much bigger celebration. You know, it's cool to be in a place where I knew Jesus had been, right? The Garden of Gethsemane, that that was a a really cool experience to, to be there knowing that that's where he had walked. we've got something better. God promises that, not that we get to be where he was, but we get to be where he is. Right now. Here, in church, where two or three are gathered together in his name, he's here with us, eternally in heaven, when we will see him face to face. Jesus has become the the banner. You catch that in verse 10? You understand that picture, the, the banner? You know, in the chaos of war, they would have their flag bearer, right? The, the banner bearer, and everyone could see where their flag was, where their banner was, and, and they would go there because that's where they needed to be for the battle, or that's where they had a safe place where they could, where they could uh, rest. They would go to that banner, and I think that the second part of that picture really is highlighted here because, because look at how um, Isaiah describes that place. He says that place of rest is glorious. We have the banner we can look to. I've seen that firsthand this week. You may be aware we've real recently here had two of our older church members die. And both of them had several, have several family members uh, that that are members here at, at church. And it has been awesome to see how those families have been flowing to that banner. To to what Jesus has brought, the peace and his promises, the forgiveness that he gives, the hope that we have in him. To be able to see them find peace, to find this place of rest being so glorious, it's, it's awesome. Friends, that's what we have. This resting place is glorious. Behold, the branch is growing. Your sins are forgiven. Your celebrations have a purpose. Your future is guaranteed. As the hymn writer put it, Behold, the branch is growing of loveliest form and grace. 
As prophets sang for knowing he springs from Jesse's race and bears one little flower in midst of coldest winter at deepest midnight hour. This flower so small and tender with fragrance fills the air. His brightness ends the darkness that kept the earth in fear. True God and yet true man, he came to save his people from earth's dark night of sin. In Christ, amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.